Hey, this is Derek, and you're listening to Skepticality, the official audio program of Skeptic Magazine, for Tuesday, December 13th, 2011. Welcome back to another episode of Skepticality, the show which brings you interviews, news, information for critical thinking, for the promotion of critical thought, and science! Okay, we have a fairly packed episode once again, and without any further delay, I once again give you Tim Farley and his chunk of Skeptic History. It's time again for some skeptic history. I'm Tim Farley of whatstheharm.net and skeptools.com. This edition we're talking about the apocalypse, some court rulings, and some rubber bands. As the new year of 2012 draws near, the Mayan calendar will no doubt be in the news. If you believe the New Agers, it predicts terrible events will occur in December of next year. But of course, there have been many other incorrect predictions of apocalypse, and I've mentioned them before on Skeptic History. Earlier this year, American radio broadcaster Harold Camping predicted a rapture in May, followed by Armageddon in October. And of course, neither of these came to pass. Religious predictions of doom are quite common. Back in 1973, an American religious cult leader, David Berg, predicted that Comet Kohutek which reached perihelion on December 28, 1973, was an omen of an imminent doomsday event. One key American doomsday prediction occurred in 1954. That was when a small group of people in Chicago, led by a housewife and influenced by Dianetics, believed they had been given a message of doom from aliens. They thought the apocalypse would occur before dawn on December 21, 1954. The group had come to the attention of social psychologist Leon Festinger, who arranged to infiltrate the group to study what would happen when their prophecy failed. His research formed the basis of what is now known as cognitive dissonance theory, a key concept that all skeptics should know. When skeptics are not looking at predictions, they often have to look into court rulings. Last year at this time, I talked about the fifth anniversary of the ruling on the intelligent design case Kitzmiller v. Dover, December 20, 2005. Let's look at a couple of other cases. An interesting criminal case took place in New York City almost 100 years ago. Astrologer Evangeline Adams had been arrested in May 1914 for fortune telling. Adams gave a reading to the judge in the case, and in the judge's opinion, correctly predicted the character of his son. He ruled on December 11, 1914, that astrology was therefore plausible and let Adams off. In later years, legal bans on fortune-telling in the U.S. have been overturned on free speech grounds. Sometimes the court cases involve the skeptics themselves. The court battle between Yuri Geller, Psy Cop, and James Randi in the 1990s dragged on for several years. It was this case that led Randy to resign from PSYCOP and eventually form his own educational foundation. The case was finally resolved on appeal on December 9, 1994, in a ruling in favor of Randy and PSYCOP. Geller was ordered to pay about $150,000. And finally, last year, the Australian skeptics relentlessly hounded the power balance company about their unsupported claims involving a rubber bracelet product. They convinced the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission to take action in a ruling on December 22, 2010, one year ago. The company was forced to admit there was no evidence for their efficacy and offer refunds to consumers. The company has had additional trouble ever since, leading to a bankruptcy filing last month. I'll be reviewing that and many other events of 2011 in my year-end wrap-up in the next edition of Skeptic History. Until then, that's it for this visit. Links to additional material are in the show notes, including the locations online where I post a new skeptic history fact every day. Thanks again, Tim. So I was sent a little audio 
promo about a cool conference, which I was going to play right here in this spot. But I thought, why not give one of the main organizers a call and have them talk all about it and how cool it's going to be so the excitement can seep out and into any skeptic who can make it. So, Michael, I have you on to talk a little bit about your fun convention out your way, uh, QED. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's coming up in March. It's the the second one we've done, and uh, it's it's looking really exciting. Uh, it's uh, one of those things, and you've organised conventions in the past, so you uh, and, and you still do, so you know how much work goes into it. And uh, once you can see how it's all starting to fit together, you do get really excited as to just exactly how it's going to be when the the weekend comes around. Uh, tell people a little bit about how QED is run and what it's about. Yeah, well, it's, it's a joint program run by uh, my group, uh, the Merseyside Skeptic Society. So there's a, a couple of guys from uh, from that group uh, and also the Greater Manchester Skeptic Society, which is another local group. And we just we came together in February uh, of this year to put on a conference in Manchester. Uh, and what we were trying to go for was a, a bit of a sort of a festival feel, I think, because uh, some conferences can be quite... Um, I don't want to say strict, but quite uh, quite uh, specific in where people are going to be and what's going to be on where, and you know, and people that have uh, have have that have a single experience. Whereas what we were trying to go for was an idea of having um, a bit like a music festival where people say, "I want to see so and so on this room. I want to go and see someone else at this room. I want to go and do this over here." And it's a, a feel of people changing rooms and moving around and lots of different kind of options and content and things like that. So that's what we've kind of tried to go for with QED. We tried to put together the conference that we'd really love to go and see. Uh, but unfortunately, obviously, because we run it, we don't get to get the same experience that everyone else does. But uh, that's uh, that's the burden, I guess, of, of running a conference, but also the exciting thing about running it. Oh, I know all about that. <laughs> now, what are the – give us an idea what the different parts of the programming is because you said there's different programming. What did, give me an idea what they what you have. Yeah, well, we have um, the the main stage, uh, which is you know the uh, three four hundred seater room, which is a reasonable size conference. Uh, it's kind of the, the size that we're looking for, uh, and that's where the sort of the headline speakers and the main speakers will be going on. But at the same time, what we're having it uh, in a separate room just nearby is the podcasting room or the breakout room, uh, where we'll be doing a different track of activities. So I know in um, in February it was really popular. We had some really great uh, um, material from uh, the Pod Delusion, which is a phenomenal podcast here in the UK. Uh, but we also had a, it was an opportunity for the speakers from the main stage to you know, talk about something else or to be involved in a panel uh, and just to, to get a bit more of an intimate kind of uh, a, a event in that side room, really. I think it's uh, you know 50 people in the room and we had a, a really great um, forum for Skeptics in the Pub where people who'd started their own Skeptics in the Pub groups could come and, and share what had worked for them and you know, sort of ask for tips from other people and just get a, a real feeling for you know the 30 or so different groups that we have around the UK just to chance for them to you know, get to know each other and, uh, and and form a few relationships really and form a few bonds uh, and then the other sort of uh, part of the, the whole experience that I think went down very well was the very active bar uh, I think that was the number one thing that uh, that Mike Hall one of them, my fellow organizers uh, was very keen on having open at all times is we have to keep the bar open at all times because quite often you'd find that people just wanted to sit there and relax with a drink and just chat to some of the other attendees you know in, in quite a relaxed environment and get a, a feel for who else is out there in the community so that's kind of the that's kind of what we we're looking to achieve and it really worked uh, in February and uh, it's it's already going to be a bigger event in uh, in March next year uh, than, than this year's event was. Do you have a sense of which name people will be there this time? Yeah, we, we've announced a, a full lineup, uh, and there's some some really fantastic speakers on there. There's um, Joe Nickel is one of our headline speakers, and I'm sure you know uh, Joe Reesbarth. He's been on the show uh, a couple of times, has he? Oh, he actually comes to my convention usually every time. Oh, well, there you go. So you know exactly how uh, how brilliant Joe is, and yeah. the great thing about Joe is he can talk about absolutely everything. Oh, he can. He's a, <laughs> also, he's also a really good poet as well. Yeah, I mean, he he's quite uh, proud of the number of different personas uh, he yeah. has, and I think that's a, a great way of looking at life. He actually, um, I met Joe in uh, in Budapest. I went to the uh, European Skeptical Congress uh, last year, and just completely by chance, I bumped into Chris French, who I know reasonably well, and he, he you know he invited us out for dinner, and we happened to go for dinner with Joe Nickel. And uh, Joe Nickel said something to me at the dinner that I think has stuck with me since, and it's it's he probably has no recollection of saying it to me, or he said it to so many people, uh, but he said to me, uh, you know what, Marsh, um, one day you'll be an 
old man like I am. And uh, you want to be able to look back at your life and say, I've caused a lot of mischief. <laughs> and I think uh, that's, that's become a little bit of a mantra of mine, really. That's kind of uh, something I've stuck to. So it'd be really great to see, uh, see Joe again and, and to see you know, what he's going to give us for QED. But the rest of this speaker lineup is brilliant. You know, you've got Richard Saunders from the, the Skeptic Zone podcast, uh, who's obviously you know, well known to you guys as well, I'm sure, and yeah. he's absolutely brilliant. Um, Ophelia Benson, uh, the, the sort of blogger, and, and uh, she's going to be talking about sort of secularism and, and, uh, and humanism, which I think could be uh, really exciting. Um, who else? We got DJ Grothy. Actually, we've uh, we've just uh, recently uh, added him to the bill, which is really great to have him there. Because I know he did uh, Tam London in the UK, but he, he did that as sort of president of the JRF, and I think it was very much a presidential address. So it'd be cool to see uh, DJ speaking about something he's really interested in and giving more of a, a general talk than uh, than specifically about his uh, his work with the JRF. I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because um, he's done that a few times for us at, at DragonCon, so it's always nice to see him talk about things he likes to talk about. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and I think that's that's the key with uh, all the people that we've got speaking. You know, we've got people like Edzard Ernst, the uh, the alternative medicine researcher, who's going to be talking about uh, you know the work he's been doing uh, at the at the University of Exeter, or had been doing up until he was uh, recently uh, he recently retired. Um, and we've got people like David Aronovich talking about conspiracy theories. Uh, actually, there's some there's someone who's really exciting uh, on this bill because it's someone that no one not not many people will know, but she's going to be really cool, and it's a lady by the name of Sarah Anglis. Uh, and what Sarah Anglis does is she um, she's a, a specialist in uh, in music and robotics. Oh. So she'll she plays the theremin with robots. Oh, very fun. And if you look up any of the stuff she does online, it's really creepy. She's got like a really creepy kind of stage uh, yeah. presence that she does. And she's got this amazing robot, which uh, it, it's got a doll's head on top of it, but it's a doll's head with all the hair pulled out. <laughs> and it's just the most macabre, creepy looking thing ever, which is, uh, which is really brilliant. Uh, and we've got, you know, loads of, uh, loads of other really great people that you can, if, if, uh, if, you know, if listeners want to check it out, it's uh, qedcon.org to see the full list of speakers. Uh, we're actually really excited that we've just announced um, that the magician Paul Zenon, uh, Who's you know, pretty uh, pretty well known in the UK? He's going to be doing the uh, evening entertainment with uh, the comedian Robert Ince. So it's a really great uh, great evening we've got planned too. Very cool. So where is the location? Uh, it's it's the uh, the um, Piccadilly Hotel in Manchester. So it's uh, it's dead easy for anyone who knows the UK to find, and it's dead easy for anyone who's just arriving in the UK to get to. Really, so uh, it's 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 the most prominent place you can find in Manchester, I think. So people can go to your website to find all the ways to get tickets and hotel information and all that yeah exactly i mean uh, the, the tickets we've tried to be uh, as reasonable as possible i mean uh, i know we, we were uh, it was 99 pounds for a ticket which is you know re quite reasonable last year we've actually managed to take 10 pounds off that so at a time when other prices uh, are going up in the whole world yeah. <laughs> uh, with, with a, a you know global economic meltdown that we're having uh, we decided to try and uh, help our, attend our attendees out a little bit and, uh, and take the, the ticket price down so it's 89 pounds uh, and 68 pounds if you're a student so you were able to make it 10 percent cheaper yeah, um, I didn't. I wasn't confident at first, but uh, the, the the amount of uh, goodwill we had from the first QED and the amount of people really excited about the event and who really enjoyed the event uh, meant that we just knew that we'd get the kind of people through the door that would uh, make it all worthwhile. And uh, you know, the, the first event, I think we had something like 300 people, and we managed to um, we were given all our proceeds to uh, to charity, all our profits to charity. So we managed to give like uh, five and a half thousand pounds to to really great charities. Uh, and this year, we, we've already sold more tickets than we did last year, so it's just going to be an even bigger uh, and more successful event, hopefully. Sounds really fun. So, hope some people can make it out there. And thanks again for being on the show. Thanks very much, Eric. It's been great. I really wish that me and Swoopy could make it out to QED this year. Maybe some of the listeners out there can send us pictures and updates from the convention and make us jealous and maybe twist our arm into possibly going next year. So I get a lot of email from parents and others who ask about good science books they can give to or read to their children. And since it is that time of year, when many folks are looking for good gift ideas, I gave a poke to someone who just recently reached a book all about evolution, so he can give everyone an idea about the book and why it might make the perfect beginner's look into the science on the fundamentals of evolution and the cause of diversity of life on this planet. Hello, 
Michael. Thanks for being on the show. Oh, hi, Derek. My pleasure. So before we get to your fun book, uh, so what led you into, to be like a skeptic or scientifically minded? Oh, I was... I don't think I was ever led into it. I think I was just born into it. My parents were uh, uh, not scientists by any means, but they were atheists and uh, enjoyed science and talked about uh, evolution as far back as I could possibly remember. So it was never, it was never even a, uh, a, a an issue. It was just understood. Yeah. So it was never. You no, know, it was never a, a. It was just always something I grew up with, and I always loved science and my. Uh, we always had a house full of animals, and um, for, I, I don't know why particularly, though, I found evolution kind of fascinating. It was a, a thing with me. It wasn't necessarily just the dinosaurs either as a kid. It was just the idea that we were once fish crawling out on land, and I just thought that was fantastic and, and really wonderful. So it was always kind of a part of me. So it just wasn't part of your family. It was just something that you personally was drawn to personally drawn to the, the science of it. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but my, but again, my family was, uh, uh, had a problem. Well, I don't, I hate to use the word atheist, just, just to say that we just were a rational, you know, bunch and, uh, religion was just always kind of absurd to us. So, uh, so I was, I think we were all drawn to science and nature and our, Vacations tended to be out in the country where we stayed in, in uh, 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 cabins and things and uh, got closer to nature. So I guess it was always a kind of a, 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 a we were always sort of bent towards biology. And then, of course, then you ended up becoming an artist? Uh, always uh, drew and sketched and painted and uh, in college decided that was what I was going to do. Uh, uh, Knowing full well, it wasn't maybe the wisest choice of career, but uh, that was what I liked. And, you know, whether I starve at it or not, that's what I wanted to do. And so I pursued art and simultaneously, of course, took, uh, you know, other college courses uh, in anthropology and paleontology. And uh, that was where the seed to this book was planted because it's part of a term paper for a paleontology course. I essentially wrote a a, a, a thinner version of this book uh, with charcoal drawings. And, uh, and I think I decided at that moment, now that's 30 years ago, but I, I decided I'm going to make a book out of this someday. And that brings us to the book. It's called Bang, How We Came to Be. And it's kind of a kid's book in a way. It is. It didn't start that way. I thought I'd do something... Uh, that adults would, well, I think adults do also like it because it's not, it's not too childish, but it was, it didn't start out as a kid's book, but ended up being a kid's book because I realized it's, it's really all about the illustrations. And, uh, and I thought that I should make something that would be easy, you know, accessible to kids and adults who, I don't want to say don't have time to read. Uh, well, to tell you the truth, I had people like, as I was writing this and putting it together, I had children in mind. And I had George W. Bush in mind. I thought, well, this might be something. And I don't say that cynically. I say that honestly. He might actually flip through this out of curiosity. And and maybe these are the people I'm trying to reach, those that aren't educated and kids who are are yet to be educated. It goes through some pretty complex ideas, but just boils it down. Yeah, well, that was the the hard part of the book because – Every page was probably three times longer to start with, and I kept uh, chiseling, you know, things out, uh, just trying to make it more palatable and um, I don't want to say easier, but but yes, easier for a, a, certainly for a kid to grasp. So I was I found myself leaving out a lot of the science that I found fascinating, but I thought, well, you know, this is good for kids, and if anyone wants to pursue this further, they certainly should. And, and, and get a really great book like uh, Richard Dawkins' uh, Ancestor's Tale, which is mentioned in the bibliography, for example. I mean, that's just one of many really good books about the topic of evolution out there. So this is just one more. But I thought this was really good for kids because of, of all the pictures, frankly. You actually put a, 
the ancestor's tale in the uh, the notes in the back of the book as well. Right. Yeah. It's a, well, because I, I refer to it myself when making the book, and um, and I think it's a good book for someone who for adults who uh, want to pursue the topic further, uh, because he's a, I think he's a wonderful writer anyway and easy to read, and but he's got all the anecdotes and interesting facts and uh, details that that really make the story. Uh, really, really interesting for adults. The book is this book out already? It is. It's a, available at Amazon and Barnes and Noble. It's kind of all over the place, and I I think it's doing well. I, this is my first book, so the whole publishing uh, industry is very new to me. But I I it's gotten some really good reviews, and I've uh, so I'm hoping it's doing really well out there. So where can people find out more about you and see some of your artwork and things like that? Well, they're certainly welcome to uh, visit my website, uh, michaelrubinogallery.com. Uh, there are links there to reviews to the book as well. And, uh, and then there's some of my, my own original artwork in there. They can kind of get more of a sense of what I do when I'm not writing books. Well, that's great because I think this would be a great – book for parents to have give to kids that they want to like read to or have their kids read especially this time of year considering you know it's gift giving season well that's what i was hoping for and i i got found a couple of blogs uh from people who apparently are uh, uh, both of them were from fathers who read the books to their kids really young kids it really wasn't even meant for i i didn't have really young kids in mind i had uh 12 and 13 year olds of mine, which are the ages of my kids. Uh, but I'm reading blogs now from people who are reading them to their five-year-olds and who, and they, apparently their five-year-olds are really enjoying it because they, and there's kind of an interaction where the, the parent can, you know, kind of point to the drawings and kind of uh, carry on further from, from my own, uh, uh, from what I've written, they can sort of add their own story or elaborate on it if they choose to, or kind of get into the illustrations with, I guess, very young kids. I didn't, I really wasn't anticipating that, but apparently that's happening here and there, and that's, I think that's great. Well, it's kind of funny because when I read it, I thought of the kind of the younger kids, not the older kids myself. So I find it interesting that you originally thought it to be older. Yeah, again, uh, my, it's my first book attempt, and <laughs> I, I, I kind of try to put myself in the mind of a 12- or 13-year-old in the sense that I know that they don't read much anymore. My kids are, you know, just completely involved in their iPods and uh, video games. And it, so it was a struggle to get them to read my own book, you know. So uh, I, I tried to make it short and to the point. And um, so maybe in that sense, it appeals even to younger kids, which is great. That's fine, fine with me, as long as people are looking at it. Uh, especially if you're a parent who wants to read to their kids, like at night or something, I think it'd be a good for, book for that. Yeah, I guess so. And I, 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 I guess I hoped for that, but apparently I'm, I'm, I'm hearing and understanding that people are in fact um, doing that. So that's great. Because I didn't think it was really bedtime reading but um, I suppose it's interesting, so it's it doesn't have a happy or a sad ending, so I suppose it's perfectly okay for bedtime reading. Well, you know, you can learn as you know you're going as to sleep. You drift off, yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show for a little bit and talk about your new book. Well, thank you very much for having me. Again, Bang is really a great little book for anyone who has a person in their life who might need a clear and concise look at evolution. We have a link in our show notes for this episode, which will give you a link where you can go and purchase a copy for yourself or send it as a gift to someone you know. When I was a kid, I really loved playing with magnets. I still love playing with them. Well, our special guest this episode gets to play with the coolest magnet in the world, literally. I got to talk to Dr. Scott Hannes. He's the director of facilities at the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory. Basically, he's in charge of the largest, most powerful magnet in the world. And who wouldn't want to know 
more about what it's like to work with a, such a cool scientific instrument and the types of experiments and the types of people who come to use such a device. Scott, how is uh, things going down there in uh, Tallahassee? Um, they're going pretty well. We're uh, in uh, our month of shutdown that we shut down every year to redo our vacuum systems and our cryogenics and we're cutting up a bunch of plumbing and replacing that and adding a new water pump and uh, tearing apart the power supplies and putting them back together and we, we have a month where we have all sorts of different things going on so it's uh, busy um, but uh, we're having fun. So. <laughs> Why don't you let people know exactly what your job is? Well, that um, when I got here, um, my my boss said, "Well, you know what we need? You, we need everything else that needs doing." And it's sort of stayed that way over the last twenty years. Um, I am the director of instrumentation and facilities, so I am responsible not only for all the scientific instrumentation and computers to interface to it, for every kind of experiment that walks in the door for the high field magnets. Uh, so I have to work with the physicists who want to measure whatever, heat capacity, resistance, uh, huge currents, little currents, big voltages, little voltages, whatever they want to measure, I have to set up make sure we have the equipment to do that. So on the science end, I'm working with the experimenters. On the facilities end, I work with our our control room operators, electronics shop, welders, and everything else to make sure that <clears throat> we can run these big electromagnets. I mean, we're working with uh, megawatts of power at one end here that come in and run the magnets compared to the well, actually down to the femto and atto watt region for doing the very sensitive measurements at low temperatures. So I, I sort of do a wide range of stuff. Now, you guys run the, is that the most powerful magnet in the world? It is the most powerful magnet in the world, where we say by power, we mean the strength of the magnetic field. Um, it's, there are two we think of them as two ways of making magnets. To, to most people, it's the same thing. You make a coil of wire, you run electricity through it. They're electromagnets, um, not permanent magnets. The, those limit out fairly low. But the, per, the electromagnets, you can make out of a special material called a superconductor that loses all its re electrical resistance, all of it. It's actually exactly zero resistance. So if you start a current flowing, it flows forever in a loop as long as the lifetime of the universe type thing. That takes very little power, but it limits to some extent how intense a magnetic field you can get. And the record for that is about, in, uh, say, 500,000 times, 450,000 times the Earth's magnetic field. We measure magnetic field in Tesla. It's around 20, 23 Tesla is the, uh, uh, the strength of those magnets. Um, a Tesla is 10,000 Gauss, which is much more common that people use, but it's not the official system international units that physicists use. Um, and the Earth's magnetic field, just for comparison, is about <clears throat> half a gauss. Excuse me. <clears throat> anyway, um, at that point, the magnetic field itself destroys the superconducting quality of the wires. The wire is no longer that great conductor, and it becomes resistive, and all your liquid helium boils away because you have to keep these things cold to make them uh, superconducting. So th there's a limit to how high a magnetic field, and we want to go higher. So the next thing is just run a, take a piece of copper, and we use uh, flat copper plates. Um, is really thick wire, and we stack these in a coil pattern. So it's, again, just electricity through a coil, but that is copper, and copper is a resistance, and it gets hot when you run lots of current through it. So we have to run a lot of cooling water through it, so we're running, because otherwise it'll melt instantaneously. So we run huge amounts of current, uh, 40, 50,000 amps into a magnet. Well, 
the best way to get to really high fields is to combine the two technologies and to start with that superconducting magnet in liquid helium and it's about two degrees above absolute zero and it sits on the outside and then in the where the magnetic field is lower and then on the inside you use that resistive magnet and you run the coil of copper and high current on the inside where it can withstand the high fields. And together it's 45 Tesla, which would be 450,000 Gauss or about a million times the Earth's field. So, and that is the world's record for a DC magnet, for a magnet that can hold that field for a long time. And we can hold that field for hours for people to do all sorts of experiments. So they'll go up and well, we hope they don't sit there for too long because our electric bill gets very, very large quickly. I was going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, our electric bill, and actually I was just doing our, our budgets for the year because I get to do that too, and we're in the midst of uh, asking for another renewal for our grant. But our electric bill is approximately $5 million a year. Wow. Good. Yeah, the the city is – sometimes happy with us because we're paying them sometimes they're annoyed with us because we're using all their power so yeah i was gonna ask i mean what power plant do you suck that power from um we suck it from the the city of tallahassee is the electric utility here and we use a regular utility line they put in a special substation uh transformer yard for our area um as as the lab was built but um Every electric utility is required to keep a 10% margin for emergencies elsewhere on the power grid. We run in that margin, so they didn't have to build another power plant for us. Um, when we're running flat out, we're about 8% of the city of Tallahassee's power consumption. The city, if they have a call for reserves throughout the power system, through the national power grid, they tell us to shut down, and we shut down our magnets. So it can be upsetting to the experimenters, but the grid is fairly reliable and doesn't happen that often unless there's, you know, some of the plants do shut down automatically and we're off for a couple hours until they can get them restarted. Or the hurricane. Or when a hurricane comes through, and then we're sort of all shut down, and we tell our users, don't even fly here and stuff. We run a user program, so as a faci user facility, we're open to users from all over the world. Uh, they come from every country we can find them at. Uh, they, they love to come here and use the facility because it's free and open to every good research proposal. So if we get we evaluate the proposals. We get uh, 100 or 150 proposals every three months, and we go through them and select the ones that are the best scientifically and allocate the magnet time that we can do, that we have the equipment, and we then schedule them, and they pick their week of magnet time, and they basically come in, and we set up their experiments starting from a bare room with a magnet in it and uh, get it all working on Monday morning and they take data till Friday and then they go home and publish a paper. So now do you keep a, uh, a list of all those papers somewhere that people can oh, look yeah. at? It's on our website. We have publication records, not only as our, our outside users, um, but um, for our annual report back to the National Science Foundation who funds us. They want to know how many papers we've published and where we've published them and, and that. So we have an annual report that we publish, and that's also on our website, uh, magnet.fsu.edu. And uh, we have all sorts of oh, Magnet Academy, little flash demonstrations of how magnetic magnets work, how magnets interact with materials and change their electrical resistance and the, the, the infamous Powers of Ten uh, video that I think simulates a view from quarks to galaxies as doing Powers of Ten and distances. So we, we try to put all that out as public knowledge. I mean, that's our role of as scientists is not only to discover new information, but to make it widely known. Yes. Now, you mentioned in our uh, talks before we did our, our interview now, you were, your 
most recent research is on something called the frustrated spin systems? Frustrated, geometrically frustrated spin systems. Um, they're frustrated. The, the spins in these materials, and they're basically the electron uh, uh, spins in the material as the electrons, and these spins come from the electrons on the copper atoms in the material. It's uh, copper, cesium, cesium copper chloride, and cesium copper bromide um, are the materials, but they're triangular. And the spins want to be opposite, like two magnets are going to want to stick together so that the north, two bar magnets, so one has the north pole up and one has the north pole down. And that's how they like to stick together. It's the same for these electrons. Is the, they want their nearest neighbor to be opposite of them. So they're an anti-ferromagnet. And a ferromagnet, like what makes our permanent magnets, they all line up together. This one's anti, so they're pointing in the opposite direction. Well, if you have a triangle, we like to think of it as three curmudgeons. You know, they're just going to be against their neighbor. And so you get two guys, and if Bob down the road says, yes, I'm going to say no, well, the problem is, is Charlie across the street, he wants to disagree with both of us, and he can't because there's only yes or no for spin up or spin down. It has to be quantum in one direction. So it makes for an odd pattern. It's frustrated. He really can't disagree and be opposite both of his ne nearest neighbors on this triangle. And so this leads to interesting quantum interactions of how these spins end up arranging themselves to lower their energy. And as you put the magnetic field on them, they'll force themselves into different correct patterns, basically, different configurations. And so it's investigating those configurations and what effects those configurations have is something I've been working with a couple of researchers from Smith College and from the University of Florida. So it's, an, it's a large collab, not a large collaboration, it's a collaboration of about three of us and we bring in graduate students and undergraduates as appropriate. Now what is the hope that you'll be able to gain from figuring out these frustrated fields? how quantum systems behave in large materials. It's a very, we can calculate it as the new supercomputers can start to do these quantum calculations and to verify these calculations of quantum interactions in materials um, for clusters of 64 atoms or however many you can do before you run out of computational speed. And then verify it with experiment to make sure that I really can model quantum interactions on computers. That would be one thing. The other, it's just a neat quantum system and we don't know quite how it works. There's some theories out there, uh, newly published, where they're trying to predict these patterns and at what field these patterns will occur. When you get a pattern where you get up, up, down, along a row of the base of the triangles, uh, where you get two up and then one down, two up and one down. And you get certain patterns. They're predicting it. To know and understand materials, we have to verify that experimentally. But it, it's, not, it's not going to lead to the next toaster or blender or anything else. It's what I like to think of as an intellectual infrastructure of basic blue sky science where we understand chunks of material. It's really easy to understand a single hydrogen atom. Quantum mechanically, you can solve a hydrogen atom. But when you get into millions, billions, Avogadro's number of atoms up to 10 to the 23rd, it's something that you can't really solve analytically. So we have these um, methods of simulating average or field effects and we want to verify that and know that we fully understand uh, the true quantum mechanics of the of large systems. So it verifies the equations that the physicists actually have determined. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as, as part of what we call condensed matter physics where we're working with large chunks of matter. We're not working with one atom or two atoms or particle physics. You know, you're usually looking at a collision of two single protons or something and seeing what comes out. Um, condensed matter, you're working with a blob of real stuff or is, is really how I like to think of it and why I do a lot of it. I've 
started out in mathematical physics at one point and it got too rarefied and I really wanted to go back to the lab and solder and work with real stuff again. Well, I've seen the pictures that you've, you're <laughs> working with real stuff. Now, considering you're working with things that there's so, I mean, like I said, it's different than a particle accel accelerator. We're kind of like the opposite of that. So mm -hmm. in a way, because these things are showing you the properties of things that are massive but yet kind of small is this kind of like a uh, deal with anything to do with big bang theory type work mm, indirectly um there has been some work um working with um vortices and simulating uh some of the possibly dynamics of the early universe in solid state systems, but not really on the cosmological scale. I mean, most of the big bang theories um, are working at such high energy densities. There's so much energy concentrated in such a small volume that really the only place that is simulated is in the particle physics when you get two little particles and they really whack into each other and you can really simulate that really high energy in very, very small volume. With condensed matter, we're working at usually very low energy densities. Most of the time we're trying to get rid of just the normal heat effects. Just the atoms bouncing around at room temperature can destroy all those spins lining up in nice neat patterns. So I have to work at temperatures that are down close to absolute zero. And by close, I mean much less than one degree above absolute zero. So that's where we try to keep the thermal energy less than the magnetic energy so that the magnetic energy can really show its effects. So we work at the really other end of the scale, the really low energy end. So you wear a coat all year long. <laughs> um, yeah, I did get, remember get asked in graduate school when I said, well, I work at 454 degrees Fahrenheit below zero. And what do you wear? Well, the, yeah, uh, the trouble is that generating cold is is really hard and it takes a lot of energy so it's generated over very very small volumes i mean we start with the magnet it's at room temperature or even hotter with the and has cooling water going through it and then we have to put a vacuum barrier and insulation and then some liquid air and then some more vacuum barrier and insulation and then liquid helium and then in that our cryostat that actually cools things down below the liquid helium temperature down to a tenth of a degree of absolute temperature. So there's a lot of layers in there. So by the time you get to the room to do your experiment, you're usually working on an area of a few millimeters. Some of our experiments work at very high pressure where we want to put things and put high pressure on it and change the distance between the atoms and materials. Now most materials really don't want to do that. So to compress things to uh, thousands of atmospheres of pressure or tens of thousands of atmospheres of pressure, you need something very hard. And a lot of the time we use diamonds. Well, we can't afford really large diamonds. So you have to go work with the something that is small compared to the diamonds you can afford. And you're working with things and attaching wires to something that's maybe a tenth of a millimeter long and you have to attach six wires to it. So we work in very small volumes that we keep these high pressures, low temperatures, high magnetic fields because of just the expense and trouble of making them big. Wow. Yeah, it just it, the the work, I when I read all the different papers and things on the website, I mean, some of that's very fascinating. And also, you let me know that you have end up being the person that they send everybody to when they have weird claims. <laughs> yes, I get those too. So I get the, the ones that uh, have perpetual motion machines or they're extracting energy from magnets. And I have to explain to them that magnets aren't a source of energy. Um, Magnets have energy because they're already in their or have magnetic field. Permanent magnets have field because that is their lowest energy state. You'd have to put energy into the magnet to destroy the magnetic state. So, but they're all convinced if there's the right 
proportion or right configuration of magnets that they can make a perpetual motion machine. And um, I get a large number of requests on that. Um, and, you know, it's usually, it all works except for one point. And then I keep going, that point is the physics of the thing is why it doesn't work. Um, the other large number of uh, issues I get, and some people are asking for medical advice, and I try to stay out of that as not being a medical doctor, um, is the health effects of magnets. And I got interested in that because when I first started working at the magnet lab back when it was at MIT, um, I got at, you know, it sort of said, well, what's the safety limit? And I started looking into all the published reports and work with magnets and found out there's really very, very little health effects and effects on the human body uh, for magnetic fields. They have very high magnetic fields. Um, blood cells may uh, change their alignment but it's got to be very high magnetic fields, and it's mainly because of the shape of the blood cells. Uh, specifically, if you have sickle cell anemia, and those are where the blood cell is elongated, those will tend to line up with the field. And these are tests they've done in test tubes, not in bodies. So we don't know what the effect is on people's health, but we know this does have this effect on blood. Um, other effects are if you move your head rapidly in very high fields, you'll get a blurriness to your vision because the it'll put a slight force on the rods and cones in the retina of your eye and make it a little wavy. Aside from that, there really isn't much documented effects of magnetic fields on uh, anything. Um, well, I think we would probably know from the amount of people who've had MRIs and all people that work in that field, there's been no... Absolutely. And those are, you know, fairly decent fields. Those are on the three Tesla uh, thing and uh, three Tesla range is about the limit of MRIs these days. Uh, we're regularly exposed to fields of about that same amount just being near the magnets here. Um, we've never seen anything, uh, mechanical failures of equipment and cell phones don't like being near magnets because it flips little relays and discharges them. And we've learned a lot of things and it'll erase your credit cards, but on your body itself, almost nothing. And we've had these effects, you know, we've looked, f people have worn magnets and look for health effects for years and years and years now. And really no study has shown any consistent effect. So, you know, those, those magnetic bracelets pretty much do nothing. Yeah, they make you feel better. <laughs> because you have one on? Because you have it on. That's right. The placebo effect is incredibly strong. It's the more you read about it. And it's really, if you believe that that's doing something for you, then it probably is just by the mere nature of that belief. Um, but there's nothing documented that's ever, it's very hard to document that. And so there, there've been a, a large number of studies over the years because it's always tricky to do the double blind study because everybody knows whether they've got a magnet or not, because if they wear a magnet, it'll stick to the refrigerator. So everybody checks. So it's really hard to do the double blind study. People cheat. People, well... Oh, yeah. <laughs> they, they don't blind themselves. Nobody, the, the, yeah. That's human nature. The, the, yeah. I mean, the, the experimenter can do it. He doesn't know which ones have the magnets, but the people themselves know. So, and it's hard to assess health effects on animals. I mean, we've established and we've tried to do constant magnetic fields. They built an entire facility to do low frequency 60 hertz uh, magnetic fields on a group of test animals in Illinois, I believe, uh, at some point, just because of the power line fears, and they found no effects. You also mentioned something about Halliburton having ma magnetic, magnetic scams that they were pawning off on some clients. Man, that was that was a, a long discussion I had with an engineer for an uh, an oil company off of Australia, and he was skeptical and uh, emailed me and said, did I ever heard this? And I said, well, I've read people who claim it, but I've never seen any good data. 
And uh, we went back and forth about the claims and how to test them. And they had clamp magnets they were going to clamp on their oil pipelines that would keep waxy buildup that would clog their pumps. And I mean, they could save huge sums of money if it didn't clog the this buildup, uh, didn't uh, clog the pumps, coalesce on the veins of the pumps. And uh, uh, basically goo them up. And so they had a list of, of magnets and then I'd, I'd say, well, clamp them on some pumps and do a test, you know, tell them you'll clamp it on a pump for a month on one pump and check it compared to the others. And he comes back and says, no, they say it can't be done. It's got to be on all the pumps. And so we went back and said, okay, well, we'll do it on this. And then they came back and said that, um, uh, that you had to put the magnet down the bore of the oil well. So you had to place the magnet way down at the bottom of this oil well, thousands of feet down. And at some point, it was going to still affect the flow of oil, this turbulent hot oil as it gets through the pumps um, miles away. And it just didn't make any sense physically. And uh, I started looking into this and it was a company and they finally pulled the whole project and uh, said they didn't want to release it because they were they were worried that it would discredit the technology before it was fully developed. And it was a company called Magwell that was bought by Halliburton. And Halliburton was going around being the one pushing this uh, technology, so to speak. Um, at that point, um, it's never come back. And I think all the ads on the web have disappeared of these magnets that would go down the uh, wells. I have a couple of screen grabs that I think I saved from back then as, as an example. But uh, it's, it's sort of gone away. Um, we did get a proposal for somebody who wanted to come here. And I'm, we encouraged it to check um, the cloud point of oil in a magnetic field. I mean, that's where you got to, somebody's got to start doing the testing to show that there is or isn't any effect. But just starting to sell these $100,000 magnets you need to buy for every oil well was a real sweet deal for uh, whoever's selling magnets because there was no evidence and there has been no evidence that this is a, a real effect. So it gives people one more reason not to like Halliburton. If they need another reason, <laughs> yeah. there may be sufficient reasons already. But you brought up things like the your mobile phones or you know your cell phones are near around mm -hmm. the magnets. You know, technically, doesn't a mobile phone technically use a system very much that like a magnet itself? So many of these claims of brain cancer in cell phones, isn't that kind of discredited alone just by the fact that we kind of never found anything to do with magnets in the first place? Um, yes and no. I mean, there's magnetic fields as a constant magnetic field has certain effects on other magnets. Cell phones and even 60 hertz power line is an actual radiation. It's a propagating wave. So you have now a wave that can travel distances. So it would be much more pervasive from that. Now, the, the counter argument is that even though it's a wave and it can go long distances and everybody's exposed to radio waves and cell phone waves, uh, they don't have enough energy to break a chemical bond. And as far as we know, all cancers happen because of somebody messing with your DNA. And, break, and changing the DNA by breaking a chemical bond. Einstein uh, got a Nobel Prize for the photoelectric effect that showed you need a certain frequency. It didn't matter how intense the light was to break bonds or to do effect, that the energy was quantized based on the frequency of the light or radiation, electromagnetic radiation. I think of it all as light or photons. But um, so it's only when you get to a certain frequency that you can actually break a chemical bond. And that frequency is up in the color blue or so. So radio waves, 
uh, cell phone waves, power line waves are all such low frequency, they're such low energy that you cannot break a chemical bond with that, uh, with that frequency, with cell phones. And I, something I always try to remind people when they freak out about cell phone cancer, and every time they've had a, done a study, it's so nothing, but they keep harping on it. Yeah, then you get something where somebody says, well, it's not all cancers you've got to look at. It's only central nervous system cancers or leukemia. And so then they do a new study and concentrate on that thing. And it's one of these things where every time you look more closely, the effect gets weaker. And that's really sort of the one of the big signals is that you don't have an effect. Um, there is a nice comic in XKCD, which I the web comic. Yeah, I think, uh, I think me and every that's listening to this probably already reads it all the time. Already, probably read it all the time. Well, there's one that sh- they, there was a, the they showed the graph of. Uh, use of cell phones and the graph of incidence of cancer. And it's pretty clear from the, the, the graph that cancer causes cell phones. Well, you know, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to go with that until they disprove it. <laughs> <laughs> makes sense to me. <laughs> yeah. Now, one of the things I found the most fascinating is there's some research down in your, I think it's part of your lab, that for doing future space rocket exploration like use it as a uh, propellant yes uh, magnetic launching um, it's basically the same concept that uh, they use for rail guns as uh, very high speed accelerating weapons so you can accelerate a chunk of metal very very high quickly with a basically a magnetic field you make the chunk of metal Part of the magnet circuit, where you said, you know, they got the coil of wire and you run electricity through it. Well, if you make one part of that coil able to slide away, at that point, it, the magnetic field wants to expand and it will cause that uh, uh, piece to move. Um, it's been talked about. The, there's two or three issues. One is to launch something with that, you have to get it up to escape velocity before it leaves the end of your magnet, which means that the acceleration is really, really high. So you end up having to construct a very heavy, rugged vehicle to launch. Um, what we've, what we do here a little bit, what they've done more at Lawrence Berkeley, I believe, and some other places, is magnetic levitation for trains. And that would is got some real nice features of being able to levitate either using superconducting magnets or permanent magnets and motion the train above the track. I mean, one of the problems with high-speed trains is that contact between the wheels and the track, and you need super straight track, and any little bump will derail the train. In this case, you can make a finite one inch separation between the train and the rail that'll glide basically frictionlessly except for air resistance you can make a very efficient train now the, the, there's some of those are in uh, use now aren't there um there's one i believe that's in commercial use in shanghai um i think there was one built in germany more as a demonstration train and I think there's a couple that have been proposed to be built, but I'm not sure the status of those. Because that that technology is just really fascinating to me. It's really neat technology. It's really tricky maintaining the the, the magnets and the the spacing between that and the roadbed, and 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 making sure it all works. So it's. It's a high maintenance at the moment. Now, this is one of the things, you know, as people do more and more, they get more familiarity, they understand the issues and the problems, and they come up with better designs as it moves through, you know, science to testing to actual engineering to uh, everyday use. So there's a natural progression there, and I'm hoping maglev will get all the way through it and we'll see more maglev high-speed trains um now there's also some alternative energy possibilities for these magnets as well 
Not so much for electromagnets. Um, there are, for use of permanent magnets, um, there's a company just down the street from us who makes a super efficient uh, compressor for air conditioning for heat pumps. And they make large ones for building size air conditioning. Um, and they use magnets, uh, high strength permanent magnets in not only in the motors as part of the electric motor, but in uh, levitating the spinning part of the motor, the armature and magnetic bearings to keep that very, very low friction. And so these are uh, a highly efficient, having eliminated almost all the friction in the motor bearings. So there are, uh, the other one is making more efficient lightweight motors for Wind turbines would be the other uh, natural use of permanent magnets. And making high strength magnetic materials is something we have an ongoing group that does materials research of what, how to make uh, ones that don't need so many rare earths. So in the neodymium, uh, uh, praseodymium, dysprosium, and the, what we I think of as the 4F uh, elements, but um, the rare earths that um, are actually common in the Earth's crust in many areas. Um, they're a little hard to refine, but at the moment, uh, all the mines that make rare earths have gone out of business except for maybe one in Australia and China has all the rest. And so there's a constricted supply of these materials to make these high strength magnets. So if we can come up with better ways to make it out of more common and easier to obtain elements, that would be one thing we would like to be able to do. And make our computers cheaper again. Make our computers cheaper, make our disk drives cheaper, make our motors more efficient and yes. <laughs> <laughs> so. Is there anything exciting going on down at the Magnet Lab if people happen to be near it? Um, let's see. If you come by in the third Saturday, I believe, in February, we have an open house and we have Tesla coils shooting sparks and we melt rocks in the geochemistry group and we measure the speed of sound and we have lasers and potato launchers and we just have all sorts of things uh, showing little scientific principles and stuff. So we get together and we have about 5,000 people show up to come and tour a, a physics lab, which is a pretty amazing group of people. So... Um, that would be the one thing. We give tours of the lab uh, every month. Um, we give tours and outreach to all the local schools, and we are certainly more than happy to talk to people about it. Actually, my next tour is for the National Science Foundation. They're coming to evaluate our proposal for another five years of operation uh, soon. So that seems to be where we're all focused on is making sure we get the best proposal in and really show what we're doing. So we're more than happy to talk about it and tell people. Great. Thank you so much for taking some time. No problem. This was fun. Yeah. So hopefully some of you can make it out, check out the world's most powerful magnet, and maybe meet the folks who keep it running. So have you heard of the Reason Rally? It's going to be the world's largest gathering of secular-minded people in history. It's going to take place in Washington, D.C. on March 24th, 2012. It'll feature music, comedy, and amazing speakers such as Richard Dawkins, James Randi, and music acts like Bad Religion. If that sounds like something you would like to go to, then I have a chance for you to win airfare for two and also a dinner with Richard Dawkins. To enter the contest, all you have to do is go to richarddawkins.net. It's one of the current featured articles on the main page. Or easier still, just go to our show notes here for this episode. It is a social media contest. So buff up your creative engine and try to win a cool once-in-a-lifetime chance to be involved with the largest secular party in history. Since it is the winter holiday season, I'm going to leave you with one of the best gifts I've had yet this year. 
It's a brand new song for my good friend, George Rabb, called I Don't Believe in Christmas. And if you're anything like me and Swoopy, you will love it just as much as we do. Again, you will find links to everything we discussed in this episode on our website, skepticality.com. Hungry for more skepticism? Want to learn the truth about the scientific controversies of our time? Then subscribe to Skeptic. The quarterly magazine Stephen Jay Gould called the best journal in the field. To subscribe, visit skeptic.com today. Every time this time of year, I weigh the way we spread good cheer and wonder if it matters one bit why we're nicer. My advice, sir, enjoy what the day brings Despite stories of kings Relish the things that you give And are given Every time this time of year I explain in ways plain and clear To my relief, I have no belief in the reason for the season But I'm one who defends if these means to these ends Result in smiling friends Who once were strangers, where's the danger? But I love it anyway Every time this time of year I voice a voice some don't hold dear And proudly shout despite my doubt Seasons greetings at family meetings and I still can enjoy Like when I was a boy Unwrapping every toy that I get And each one I'm giving This is living I don't believe in Christmas But I love it anyway The best of intentions never equal the gifts that you got With a season so perfect I'll forgive that its reason is not Every time, this time of year I love the love both far and near And wonder if it matters one bit why we're nicer Please be nicer Just be nicer Merry Christmas!